Hello, and welcome to the Euro What, episode number 25 for the week of September 10th, 2018. I'm Mike McComb, and I'm joined today by Ben Smith. Hey, Ben. Hey, Mike. We are a couple of Americans trying to make sense of the Eurovision Song Contest. This week, we'll be talking about starting to plan for your Eurovision vacation. Oh, remember how we thought like two weeks ago that we were going to know where we were, where the host city was by now? We were younger then and yeah, it, de- dewy-eyed and uh, so so naive. So naive. It was it was a younger time, a brighter time. It was supposed to be announced this past week which city in Israel would be hosting the Eurovision Song Contest in 2019, and there were some people in Tel Aviv who said, "Yes, we." submitted Tel Aviv and it has been accepted and a letter has been sent to the EBU. Meanwhile, the EBU has been, please wait until we announce from our official channels before doing anything. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just like, guys, can you please wait just for like five minutes? Oh man, like it's, I don't know. It reminds me of an old job that I used to have where it's just like every single department was just going to handle their own communications and leave the actual communications department out of communicating anything and Mm -hmm. i'm not super confident about the level of organization at this point the fact that the ebu has already like this is the second time that they're just like telling everybody to cool their jets is (laughs) not great like it's september (laughs) it's september come on guys we have we have like a rollout timeline you can't just tell everybody that you're hosting it until we until we until we've like inked the paper they haven't even announced dates yet, which I think is probably what the holdup is, where it's just like they may have a city in mind, but I know there are some national holidays that are in effect and like sporting events and just other logistic date related issues that will have an impact on when and where the contest will be held. In the meantime, there's a real fun boycott sort of brewing potentially, although I looked at the story, which we got from WeWe Blogs. I also saw it on Eurovois. I don't know. I feel like we've been talking about potential boycotts since Israel won mm-hmm. in May. This one's kind of cool because it has some noted, some actual American names I recognize signing it, which is fun. One of the people from Arrested Development, Aliyah Shockett, has signed it. Of, of the various U.S. names, that was the one that stuck out to me. Yeah. The TV show, not the band, correct? Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. And like Brian Eno, I think, was like the biggest american music related name that i saw on the list noted crossword to phil brian eno mm-hmm. yes yeah <laughs> it, it's yeah that's gonna be a fun talking point like as this continues to develop and i think we've been saying that since may but again just just watch it just sitting back and watching how this goes has been very interesting yeah yeah although i uh saw an article just before we started recording that denmark's just like nope we're not boycotting we're yeah. full, full steam ahead so yeah i guess that's a good shot that they could win because like yeah. that's at least one guarantee well i guess two guaranteed appearances like it'll be israel versus denmark and <laughs> yeah exactly yes. a very short eurovision this year it's great israel will qualify from semi-final one denmark will qualify from semi-final two wait never mind israel will automatically be through so never mind yeah actually we know that estonia will be there oh yeah oh yeah we do know estonia will be there uh with uh since they have put a pin in the date for their final on february 16th yes i've already got it marked on my calendar i'm getting to the part of the year where suddenly the the end of my little day planner is, get, is closer than the beginning of it so i've got like the big section in the back where i've noted things that felt so far away earlier in the year but are getting much much closer like a friend's reading in the spring and now i can just write down estonia's final february 16th yeah and it should be a good show estonia usually uh, puts on a a pretty good final and mm-hmm. their, their selection process is pretty short two semifinals and a final it's a good listen and then the other programming one that we know of at this point is spain's uh, operation triunfo which is the process they used last year to select their entry those shows start next monday the way that it worked on the show it's not the winner of the show that necessarily goes to eurovision they have like when they're down to i think it was five contestants they were just like this week's eurovision week and whoever wins the eurovision challenge gets to go to Eurovision. I don't think Spain has locked down what their plan is yet, but it'll probably be OT related. I'm pretty sure you're able to watch it over streaming. We'll, we'll keep tabs on that and let you know if it's uh, something that you'll be able to stream uh, stateside. October 10th is expected to be the deadline for countries to indicate if they are going to participate or not. It's not too late, Liechtenstein and Monaco. You can still get in there. Slovakia can always change their mind, but... <laughs> mm-hmm. 
by this time next month, uh, we should have a pretty good idea of how many countries will be competing. Yeah, and speaking of this time next month, uh, America's Got Talent will be down to their final five contestants yeah. in week 37 <laughs> yeah. of figuring out the final five contestants. Now, now, they are they are in the semifinals right now. Uh, they had their first semifinal last week, so if you got one more semifinal, then it should be the final, and then I and think that's it. And then just three it. more weeks of finals, and we'll have a winner. America has talent. The rumors are true. Although, Glennis Grace, uh, who's the Eurovision alum, will compete on Tuesday, so the day after we record this, and the results won't be known until Wednesday after this episode is dropped. So maybe she'll do well. Maybe, who knows? Singers, it seems, I think all of the singers from the first semifinal were eliminated, so uh, things aren't looking great. I mean, on the other hand, with America's Got, America's Got Talent, at least in my limited knowledge, uh, it either goes to a singer or a child ventriloquist. So uh, NBC's Making It is finally over as of last week, so I am freed from the spell where I have to watch the last five minutes of America's Got Talent every week. So I no longer care. Although, I did care this week because, as it turns out, like one of the competitors, uh, we talked about uh, Father Ted earlier in the summer, and how they, they were like, oh man, we can totally jack the melody from this obscure Eurovision B-side. Nobody will be able to tell, and like everybody could tell. Uh, we had like a fun American version of that because there was one of the competitors, Amanda Mena, did like some sort of weird, slow, dirgy version of Pharrell's Happy, but like did it in front of a background that looks suspiciously like Sweden's uh, entry this year. Yeah, not just the background, but like doing the same weird, my arm is going to be the boom for my microphone pose that like starts off the uh, performance and watching the video of it, like a lot of the same like, camera choices. It's a slightly different color scheme for the background, but they're, they were going for the exact same effect. Yeah, like they're going for the same effect uh, and like they did keep to a lot of the same camera motions, but then I felt like that one broke away from that much faster than the Swedish one did. Yeah, like you, the, there were several points where like you got to see the entire stage it wasn't trying to create the illusion that it was just this space 2001 platform that she was on so often americans see a cool thing and we remake it in america and it's terrible and we, we ruin it and i feel like that was the case here. yeah and uh much like sweden's entry this year it was not well received by the home voting audience and uh amanda was eliminated but I'm glad people got to see that visual spectacle because it was it was a cool visual. It's that just... was one of my favorite visuals. I totally get why Sweden did not win this year, but I th I thought that was a good one, and it definitely stood out when we were sort of reviewing all of the Melody Festival and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another TV appearance, which really this isn't so much Eurovision in the wild. It's just uh, I follow Imri Ziv, uh, Israel's competitor last year on Instagram, and uh, he was posting some stuff from uh, Israel's version of uh, Ninja Warrior. And yeah, it turns out that he was competing on it. And at first I thought, like, based on our conversation from our last episode, uh, where Noam mentioned that uh, if you don't finish in the top 10, your career is pretty much over and you're going to end up doing musical theater. And I thought he was, I thought Imri Ziv was on the regular version of Ninja Warrior being like, oh, the singing thing didn't work out. I'm just going to <laughs> like do obstacle courses from now on. Uh, it turns out it's like Israeli Ninja Warrior VIP. Uh, celebrity edition yeah yeah and i i like that the, the term is vip instead of celebrity i think that is a much mm -hmm. more accurate description and american shows should borrow that they, they they really should because i remember uh the mole and like the last few seasons they did celebrity edition and it was mostly just whoever abc could scrounge up right yeah i also watch uh the dutch mole which thankfully does not qualify things as celebrity mole it's just moved into the these are all kind of celebrity people and that's why it's entertaining to watch this mm -hmm. but even then it's you can tell that it's like the Dutch version of D-list celebrities, which is which is hilarious because you get things like, this is the person who played Bert in the Dutch version of the Mary Poppins musical. Or <laughs> this is the person who represents the police on the news. Wow. See, VIP is a much more accurate VIP term, is a much better but... term for that because, yes, those are all, I hesitate to say very important people. They're, they're important people. For the purposes of the show, very important. Yeah. Because or, they're the contestants. Yeah, or... I don't know, maybe I doesn't stand for important. I'm trying to think of what the I could possibly stand for. Like, very insta-famous people. <laughs> uh, the last item that we have on kind of catching up with Eurovision alumni. Oh, yeah, like the, the fun human interest story, which is that Madame Monsieur, uh, the, the French act from this year, have finally met Mercy, the person they wrote a song about, despite being two French people who didn't really know her life. Mm-hmm. 
and, and that's we'll a story. That sounds yeah. kind of <laughs> there. And it's like, hey, they did that. Good for them. Yeah. So I mean, there, there, there were cute topic, photos, but yeah, yeah. there were cute photos. It's great. It was a it was a PR thing for them. It's fine. Let's get on to our main topic. But which again, remember when we thought we were going to know a host city this time, and we would get to say, you know, here's how you can get to, you know, let's say for the purpose of the, this Tel Aviv. We were going to talk about, okay, but like, how do you do this whole crazy going to Eurovision thing? Because you have done that twice, Mike. Yes. And I have done some international travel, both for work and for pleasure, but I have not logistically done sort of the work to go, okay, but how do I get to this place and enjoy other places in Europe on the way, perhaps? And then tickets and then lodging. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of plates that you have to keep spinning. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's also a tough process because you're just dealing with the time zones uh, alone can be mm-hmm. super challenging. Like this year in particular with having to try to get the tickets and waking up at four in the morning to get a lottery number to possibly get tickets. It's a challenge, but it's worth it. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot that goes into like really any sort of international travel. And we're going to try to keep this topic sort of on the general. Yeah, as I'll say, let's keep it on the general side. So again, we don't have dates yet. We don't have a host city yet. So we probably don't have tickets yet. So let's let's save that for once we've got that a little bit more nailed down. Yeah, but there is some stuff that you can do now uh, as, as you're getting ready for this trip that can make your life a lot easier. What are some of the things that you can do now while you're waiting for like the host city to get named? First and foremost, if you do not have your passport yet, get your passport. Like there is no reason to wait until the later stages of your trip planning. Get that stuff locked down because that way, by the time that you are actually flying, you'll have had it for like six months, which means that you'll breeze through customs slightly more easily. And also it works as an alternate form of ID. So if you need to renew your driver's license at the DMV, you can use your passport as like a secondary form of identification. I think one of the myths that's out there is that you have to have a trip planned in order to get your passport. No, you just have to submit your documents and send in a money order for, I think it's like 110 bucks and especially if you do it like well ahead of time you don't have to pay for the expedited service like Mm -hmm. you're just going to be saving yourself money in the long run if you have your passport again it acts as as an alternate form of id it allows you to plan other trips besides just eurovision if you're near the canadian border hey you can go to canada now it's fun Mm -hmm. usually you can get most of it if not all of it done like at your local post office which is great i couldn't be like they wouldn't do the photo part at mine but i could do like the money order portion uh, but I also, my post office is right by a CVS, which is great because CVS is on their website always has like a $2 off passport photo thing. Like always. It's great. If you live by like a college campus, um, and I know that some library systems, they'll sometimes bring people, like bring a service in to do passport photos and help you with the passport processing. So that's another thing to keep an eye out for where it's like, oh, they're coming in Thursday evening. I'm free that night get that taken care of it is not that difficult of a process but if you wait until the last minute it can be a real headache if you're cutting it real close you may have to go to like a passport agency and there's only a dozen and a half like across the country i've encountered college students who were just like oh i suddenly got into the study abroad program i have to drive from cleveland to chicago to get my passport done overnight and it's like yeah don't do that to yourself. Take care of your passport now. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. Like, especially because this is not happening until next May. Get, like, do this now as your first step while we wait for the rest of the details to get down. Yeah. Um, and if you do have your passport, number one, awesome. Uh, number two, you just want to make sure that it is good through the end of 2019. There are a number of countries that won't let you in if there's only like six months or less left on your passport so yeah you just want to make sure it's good through the end of the year if it's not then uh just take care of the renewal it's pretty much the same process uh as Mm -hmm. getting a new passport and i think it's just a little bit cheaper because you don't have to do like the first time activation fee so yeah once you get your passport taken care of it's a matter of trying to figure out how to get to the host city and yeah this is where a lot of the planning and creativity can come in. First of all, you're dealing with a lot of time zones, so finding an ideal flight is going to be next to impossible. Israel is seven hours ahead of Eastern time. 
if it's not a red eye type flight, then you're going to be arriving probably one in the morning Europe time, but you're going to feel like it's three in the afternoon. <laughs> so oh, yeah, no, I can I can completely speak to that because I have I have flown to work over to the Netherlands and have like left at like 7 p.m. and have gotten there at 6 a.m. Basically, mm-hmm. your your body's just like, OK, but like it's time for bed. Yeah. The first time that I traveled internationally, I uh, went to London like 7 a.m. U.S. time. And by the time I got to London, it was the same day as the State of the Union, and I'm taking a cab to my friend's uh, flat. And they were talking about the State of the Union, but they were talking about it in the future tense, even though outside it was like close to midnight. And it's like, I don't know what time it is. It was mm-hmm. it was so jarring. Last year, as I went to uh, Iceland, I went to Reykjavik mm-hmm. for essentially a long weekend we left Boston at about 9 p.m. Uh, we got into Reykjavik and it was 6 a.m. And my body was ready for bed, basically. Mm-hmm. It was just like, okay, cool. It, I was on the plane for like four hours. The last couple of trips I've taken that have been international, I'm not sure I have any sort of jet lag recommendations. But like I had like a day where I could like essentially tire myself out by like walking around or taking the train or just like occupying myself that way and then just like crashing for a few hours during the afternoon when my when it was like naturally tired time. Mm-hmm. And that ended up working and sort of helping me get reset, but yeah, like last year we started out in Budapest and I think I was awake for maybe 28 hours straight from when we left Chicago to when like finally went to sleep that first night just kind of powered through that uh this year in portugal it was at least 30 hours like and yeah i mean like part of part of it is like the adrenaline excitement that kind of carries you through and then part of it is mm-hmm. just being like i'm not gonna be able to sleep on the airport uh i'm six three so like trying to sleep on an airplane is just not a thing that happens <laughs> Mm-hmm. so and yeah as as someone who is just shy of six foot i share your pain yeah yeah <laughs> literally the, plane is, uh, not, the no. plane is not built for me i i am about six foot and i enjoy the window seats so that's just not gonna happen yeah if you have any jet lag strategies uh, i would love to hear them but a lot of it is just kind of powering through and then just force yourself onto local time uh in terms of flying one of the things to consider is well budget is probably going to be the overall concern throughout Uh, what we're talking about today. Figuring out flights, there are a lot of discount carriers that'll take you to Europe. uh, And then like, there's more pricier options if that's within your means. Yeah, it it can really be a mixed bag. I subscribe to a few of the mailing lists for the various airlines that fly out of Boston that occasionally have good deals like Norwegian and Wow Air. Like one thing you gotta be tricky, you gotta be tricky with is that sometimes you will see like a ninety nine dollar flight to Reykjavik, one thirty nine one way flight to London, which that's a pretty good deal. But like by the time you get through their process, where you were surprised you are paying for picking a seat, you were paying for checking your bag, you were paying for like three other things along the way. If it's within a hundred bucks of what you'd be paying for like one of like a full service airline and the stuff that they would include for free, uh, I would go with that. Yes, is it is a little bit more expensive? Yes, but like there's a lot of things that you won't have to think about. There, it it will probably be the the actual service itself will probably be a little bit more luxurious, even in even in coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, again, just going back to Iceland, uh, I was looking at Wow Airlines because I live in Boston. They occasionally have ninety nine dollar one way flights, and that's a pretty dang good deal. By the time that I had checked a bag and I had picked a, a seat and I had dithered on whether i wanted dinner or not on the plane i was like okay so for 50 bucks more i can jump on this iceland air promotion and they will pay for me to check up to two bags there is a meal included there's like an actual entertainment system on the plane so it was it was a win-win there i don't sleep well on planes so the just having like a slightly cushier experience while i was like reading slash watching promotional materials on the entertainment system that was just a better fit for me you had like a really interesting flight experience coming back from Portugal. Yeah, I was doing a uh, discount carrier from Barcelona to Boston to Chicago, and it seemed like a really good deal. And like I knew it was like a discount airline, so it's like all right, just got to keep an eye on like got to pay for the meals ahead of time, all of that, and you kind of just take a lot of stuff for granted where it's just like they they will charge you for a cup of water like it it is that level of like you are you will pay for every single thing on the flight and 
we went into it knowing that that was going to be the situation, was like totally fine with it. Not everybody on the flight knew about it. So there were like three or four times where I could overhear like passengers arguing with the flight attendants and being like, why do I have to pay $5 for a can of soda? And it was just like, uh, you, yeah, that's kind of what you signed up for. I'm sorry. It's like, it's a really good deal. And like, it's, it was a direct flight, but I did not find that the airline was particularly well run. And uh, anytime that I had an issue, like trying to connect with their uh, customer service reps, it was kind of a nightmare. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, the the cheap can come out expensive. Make sure that like the, the deal that you think you're getting is actually a deal and that you're not secretly paying just as much. Right. Particularly with the baggage, because like there are some discount airlines where if you bring anything larger than a purse or a computer bag, even if you're bringing it as your one carry on, you need to pay like 50 bucks for that carry on. Or mm -hmm. like if you don't pay for your baggage at the time of booking, it's going to be double if you do it between the time of your booking and the flight. And it's going to be triple by the time you get to the airport. So it does take a little bit of research. Another way to kind of mitigate your costs is coming up with a creative itinerary. And part of this is going to depend on how long of a trip you're willing to have uh, for your adventure. Uh, so the two years uh, that I've gone to Eurovision, uh, we've planned for like a week and a half, two week trip. So it wouldn't be just at the host city. It would be uh, other locations as well. So like last year we were flying out of Chicago and I found a really good flight to Budapest. And it's like, oh, okay, that's pretty cheap. And then, well, we can take the train from Budapest to Vienna. That's not really any more expensive than just flying directly to Vienna. So we'll do that. Bratislava and Vienna are only about an hour apart from each other. So it was another short, inexpensive train ride. And then there was a really cheap flight from Bratislava to Kiev. So that's how we ended up kind of just kind of hopscotching to our ultimate destination. And also like just the way that their infrastructure is set up. There are cheap flights everywhere. The tricky part is just getting from the US to Europe. And once you're there, like your options increase and the, the price between those options decreases. Yeah. And I mean, there are discount carriers uh, there as well. But I mean, even even with like their draconian pricing, it's not that bad. It's like, oh, okay, it's a twenty nine dollar flight plus. Okay, I've got to pay twenty five bucks to check my bag. That's still less than sixty bucks. You're still getting from one country to the other and hanging out on a plane for an hour. Yeah, and and that's the other thing is like the the flights are pretty short. Like I think trying to look at getting to Tel Aviv, like if you go to like amps like go from amsterdam to tel aviv i think it's only like a four and a half hour flight which that's what boston to denver boston to vegas like that's that's probably about boston to denver that's not bad at all you have a lot of options in terms of like hopscotching around uh either by plane or or by train the bus system there is also pretty robust so mm -hmm. yeah like the, there are plenty of travel options available once you get there it's just a matter of getting there first that that gets tricky so well yeah and like if you are logistically minded like both you and i are minded, mm -hmm. you can sort of plan these things out well in advance and have your radar up for figuring out what getting a good price on that first step and then figuring out the the rest of the steps in similarly inexpensive fashion there are plenty of websites to help out with that uh kayak sky scanner once you get to your host city you're probably going to want to find a roof or actually you'll probably want to have the roof before you get to the host city yeah, just so it, you have a destination to get to well, especially just thinking about if you are if you're trying to do this on some level of a budget mm -hmm. one of the easy ways to save on on lodging is to have your plans well in advance and get that stuff locked down when you're traveling abroad, your main options are sort of Airbnb versus hostel versus hotel. Mm -hmm. I have done the hostel thing just in the U.S. when I was traveling to like D.C. from Boston because that's far enough outside of the range that I could get away with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and learned that the the like open dorm hostel experience is not for me. I have apparently passed whatever age, age range I needed to be to be cool with that. If I'm planning out far enough in advance, like when I did Iceland, like one of the first things I locked down was a hotel because I got a really good deal through Expedia. Mm. There are chains of hotels like Yotel and like Citizen M where the rooms are very minimal, where like I, I particularly love Citizen M and they are in a bunch of different European and cities and now places like New York City, where the room itself is pretty minimal. It's got like a big platform bed and it's got like a little shower cubicle and it's pretty bare bones. But I'm usually only in, only in a hotel to sleep anyways. Right. It's not quite as crazy as like the Japanese capsule hotels, but it's sort of the same sort of 
smaller room idea. Uh, I really like those, and like usually in Europe, you can find those for like sixty bucks a night, and they are oh, starting nice. to pop up. There are little, there are things that are like that that are starting to pop up in the U.S. too. Like my go-to hotel in New York City is the Jane, which used to be a hotel for Navy people, and has a bunch of like berth-like rooms that have a shared bathroom on the floor. Okay. Uh, but your room is basically the size of like a ship cabin, and they have rooms that are either one bed or that are bunk bed. Uh, same with like a Yotel or a pod hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, but like that's definitely a hotel option in a lot of like major European cities. If you want like a proper hotel, a that's going to be slightly more expensive. But think about that in advance. Check sites like Expedia, where if you have an account, you can often get like secret hotel deals and get ten percent off. Oh, nice! If you're going for a week, uh, Airbnb is gives you the opportunity to basically take over an actual house that has bedrooms and a kitchen and stuff like that, which that's another way to save money is if you just figure out what the local supermarket system looks like, you can, you can get a chance to kind of live the day to day life of the, in the city you're at, uh, find some interesting cured meats. That's sort of a deal that at least that's, that's my sort of go to is okay, cool. Let's find some cured meat. Let's find like the weird candy section. That was basically what I did in Iceland. One, one night I went to the, the supermarket specifically for where is your candy aisle? Nice. So I can get, I could stock up on the Haribo so I could get some sort of sort through all of the various chocolate bars with licorice in them to figure out which ones were not the salty licorice, which is terrible. Oof. But we're just like normal licorice, which is fine. I am a huge proponent of Airbnb. I've done that for most of the cities that we visited. Um, and part of that is just because like if you're spending a week there, you'll probably want laundry. And a lot of Air- Airbnbs uh, will have, they'll have a washer. Uh, I don't think dryers are common in Europe, but there will be like a drying rack or uh, clotheslines or some mechanism where you can just hang your wet clothes. And uh, yeah, that works out great. Yeah, particularly if you're doing a longer term trip, like of anything more than a week, having access to a laundry is really helpful. Um, and then, yeah, there's just kind of, a charm that you're not going to get at a hotel that you get with Airbnb uh, locations. Like the place that we stayed in Budapest, the outside, it was just this kind of nondescript building. But as soon as you open the door, it just opens into this courtyard area that, and that's how you get into the various apartments. And it's like, oh, wow, this is so cool. Like it was just totally unexpected. And our host left us a bottle of wine and like a nice uh, welcome note. And it was just the most charming place to stay. And it's like, oh, wow, this just feels so homey. And Mm -hmm. I was really, really comfortable. And it didn't have the sterile feeling that a hotel can often have. Most places are going to have Wi-Fi, and if, and if place and if a place doesn't have Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is readily available pretty much everywhere. I, I strongly recommend the Airbnb. I've I've not done like the European hostels. I I too am outside of the age range. I think where that would be the best choice. Like unless you're like passing through a city, I don't see it being much of an advantage. Well, yeah, and like most hostels do have like single rooms, but they're just as expensive as like a hotel. So mm-hmm. why, like, if you're if you're gonna if you're willing to pay that much, why not get the full hotel experience? Right. I I think for for charm and especially if you're traveling for like a week or you're doing sort of an extended stay, doing an Airbnb. The last few that we had to stay at, it was a room in an apartment rather than having the whole apartment to ourselves. And our hosts were just really helpful in like giving us directions on where to go. And they were also like very hospitable and being like, oh yeah, you need to check out by 11 because we have somebody coming in this afternoon. But feel free to leave your stuff here, especially if like your flight's not leaving for a few hours. And yeah, still able to kind of do the tourist thing, like get the last few hours of your visit, like make those count rather than just hanging out at the airport. The other tricky part of uh, planning a trip like this is paying for all of it. Dropping that cash. It can be really kind of intimidating just kind of thinking of how much all this costs, particularly if you're going to countries where the exchange rate isn't as favorable. Like this year, Mm -hmm. even though Portugal has had some financial difficulty, it is still on the euro and the euro is stronger than the dollar. So like did have that currency exchange to deal with. So it made things a little bit more expensive. This coming year, uh, being in Israel, the exchange rate's a little bit more favorable. So uh, your dollar should travel a little bit farther. One of the things that I strongly, strongly recommend is starting an online savings account. There are services like Ally. It's just like 
a normal bank savings account. It's just since it's all online and they, they don't have branches that they're operating, there aren't any fees and there's usually a very favorable interest rate uh, to your savings account. Uh, you can also set up automatic transfers into the account. So yeah, if you're able to scroll away like $25 a week and just have that money automatically going into your savings account, it's just building up and building up and then you're getting interest on top of that. And then when paying for your airline tickets, paying for your Eurovision tickets, paying for any of the expenses as they are coming up rather than in one huge chunk at the end, like you can continue building up a substantial savings account and it works out great. <laughs> so I had been using capital, which mm-hmm. I liked because I could set up specific goals. I could give it little rules like like I had one rule where I was like, OK, so I'm going to do one dollar this week, two dollars the next and so on and so forth until I'd done 52 uh, because over time that builds up and that and suddenly at the end of a year surprise you have like 1500 bucks nice but like i had another one where uh i had that i called my coffee fund where what i did was like every time i go to the bakery that is next to my office uh it automatically takes a buck from my account and puts it in a coffee fund so that eventually i will get a free cup of coffee on myself oh nice or or just sort of something that i can dip into now and then just sort of as a well as long as i'm going here and as long as this is a temptation let's let's turn this into a savings thing yeah so no, there, there's stuff like that there's other apps out there uh you have to kind of take a look make sure that they a work with your bank because sometimes they do that and then all of a sudden they don't anymore mm-hmm. some of them do have extra fees for for transferring your money or for just using the service over time so keep an eye out on that but that is another way to kind of take saving for a big goal and making it kind of mindless the more you can automate it the better another service that i recommend is uh getting a credit card that has like no foreign transaction fees particularly if you're planning on booking a lot of uh activities on your trip yeah just having it all on a single credit card where you're also not paying like a penalty basically on top of what you're spending keeping all that information in a single spot and then making it easier to like reimburse yourself from your savings account so you buy your airline tickets this one credit card and then you take the money out of your savings account to pay for that if you figure out the timing correctly you can maximize how much money is in your savings account until the absolute last minute before you have to transfer it over so that you can maximize the interest that you're getting exactly with something like this there's a lot of logistical stuff but like if you spread out those expenses Mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you're not trying to figure out oh god how do i do all of this at once where is that money gonna come from you just spread it out because like that was a big way that i did a lot of what i did in in ice like once i kind of had a date range i wanted the second that there was that iceland air had a sale swooped in got airfare and that gave me some dates so the next time my paycheck hit when i was ready to go and had done my research on hotels found a good deal there Mm -hmm. locked that down and then i still had a couple months before things to kind of spread out and set up some savings goals so that i had money to have fun with while i was there set up some other stuff so for some tours i was doing while i was there so i got those squared away just sort just figuring out all those little things things that you can book now things that you can book like in a few weeks going up to things and sort of figuring out how to space things out we will soon find out what the actual dates of the competition are you'll be able to work backwards from that and just being like okay like getting the flights as soon as a good deal comes about like you've you've got time to figure that out and then the tickets probably won't be going on sale until january february anyway so you have until then to like kind of figure out your finances and then once you buy your tickets there's nothing that's going to happen between buying the tickets and the show that will be like major expenses like you'll have to book your airbnb but again you can figure out your lodging situation like you've got time to figure that out and it's like okay Maybe December might not be the best time to do that because there's holidays. There's probably other travel that's happening at that point. Yeah, you can probably push that into February, maybe even March and do those expenses. And then like all the activities that you're going to do once you are at your destination, like bike tours, museum tours, anything that you'd need to get like tickets or like put a deposit down. You can probably do that four weeks at the most ahead of your trip. You can chunk this out so that you're not paying for everything at once because it can be a couple thousand bucks in the end, but you don't have to pay $2,000 on the very first day that you're just like, okay, I guess I'm going to do this trip. Where am I going to find the money? It's like, you'll, it'll come together eventually. Exactly. One thing that's probably a good thing to do sort of in that same kind of 
passporty stage as long as you're doing some of that pre pre planning mm-hmm. uh check out the, you know just check out the state department's international travel site uh for this year check out the israeli travel details check, look look into that stuff see what the whole policy is see if there's any sort of fun stuff that you need I, I don't think that there's like any shots needed or any medical stuff, but you never know. Things change all the time. You shouldn't need a visa to get into Israel, but it is a little bit more politically charged there. So there are more stipulations than in previous host cities, uh, recent host cities. So definitely take a look at the uh, the State Department website. We'll have links to that in the show notes, just, just to make sure that all of your bases are covered. I think that's going to do it for this episode of the Euro What. Thanks for listening. Uh, the Euro What podcast is hosted by Mike McComb, that's me, and Ben Smith. That's me. You can find us on our website at eurowhat.com and on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at eurowhat. If you'd like to contact us by email, we can be reached at esc at whatelseison.tv. We'd love to hear your questions and comments. Also, if you have any other travel tips that you'd want to share, we'd love to hear those too. You can subscribe to the Euro What on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or the podcast app of your choice. We also just got set up with Google Assistant, so you can just say, OK, Google, play the Euro What podcast. We'll be back in a couple of weeks to try to make sense of what's new in Eurovision. 